I am talking about Gothic in a Galaxy Far, Far Away, which is uh, Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi as Space Gothic. And I need to move a little bit. Okay. All right. Uh, and don't worry, we are going to watch the throne room fight. <laughs> okay, so, oh, rude. Um, what I did was, you know, we talk about Gothic as an aesthetic and then Gothic themes are kind of separate. So I broke the presentation into two parts and we're gonna talk about the aesthetics first and then we'll talk about the Gothic themes. Um, they kind of run through Star Wars, but I think they're the most prevalent in um, in eight in the last Jedi. So I'm using that movie, particularly if people want to bring other stuff in later on, um, afterward as part of the chat, then we can definitely do that. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is that I'm going to compare the first order aesthetics to, um, the resistance, resistance aesthetics in a couple of different ways. So on it's my right, you have the first order. Um, and then on the other side, you have the resistance. So when I showed Sam this slide <laughs> the other day during the tech check, she said, could this possibly be any more Gothic? And the answer really is, is no. Um, this is not normally something you would see inside of a, a spacecraft, um, but you see it inside of this one. And uh, throughout all of Star Wars, the the Empire and the First Order, both there's a lot of black. Um, there's not as much red earlier on. The First Order has a lot of red. Um, the walls are red, the lights are red. The Praetorian Guard is what the guys in red are, the red ninja dude. Um, so you have this black and red color scheme. The lighting is very dim. Um, but the surfaces are reflective, so it creates a lot of shadows. So it kind of gives you the idea of this um, this old manor house with a lot of shadowy corners, even though it's very modern, it's sleek, it's angled. Um, it's the same sort of feeling as a, as a big mansion. Um, it's a large space with high ceilings, and it's designed to make its visitors <laughs> or its victims feel very small and lost and intimidated and frightened. Um, and then that that reflective surface makes the space look even bigger and more endless. So again, it's the same idea that you would have walking into this huge mansion with a giant central staircase and shadows and gargoyles and stuff um, for the first time. It's specifically set up, um, you know, the guards are all wearing masks, so you can't see their faces anyway but it's specifically set up so that you have trouble seeing the person who's on the dais in, in the big chair, anyone who's standing in front of you, you have trouble seeing their face and reading their body language. So it's another way that the space becomes very intimidating. Um, all the sharp, clean edges resemble weapons, so it's a threat. And there's no portholes or windows of any kind, so you can't see outside. Um, so it's just, it's set up to be a very threatening space. Um, the same way, you know, a, a grand hall with lots of animal heads would be in my mind. But the, if you compare it to the resistance space, it's very different. Um, this is the, this is Leia's ship. Um, and it's white. The lights are bright. The LED displays are blue. They're not red. Um, everyone's on the same level. It's a contained space, so everyone is closer together. You can see each other. You can read body language. You can read facial expressions. Um, all the edges are curved. Um, so the doorways are curved. The lights are curved. The displays are curved. And you can't see it in this picture, but at least all of the spaces have windows or viewports so you can see outside. So you're getting the freedom of space travel instead of being closed into this really scary space. 
And another really interesting thing is if you look at the exteriors, um, the interiors reflect this as well. The first order exteriors look almost exactly the same as the Empire's exteriors did. The, the Star Destroyers have not changed shape at all. Um, so they have continued to do exactly the same thing that their predecessors did. So it's this attachment to the past um, and the shapes of the past and the colors of the past that you know we get in these in these Gothic stories where they're continuing to do what's been done in the past, which is what's getting everyone into trouble in the first place, um, trying to continue this direct line. Um, whereas the rebellion and the resistance, um, the white ship with the with the red is Leia's first ship. The um, Cantai Four was her ship uh, in the first Star Wars movie, the one that um, Vader captured her from, and then the ship that's lower down, um, that's sort of the camo colors is her ship, the Radis, in episode eight. So you can see that her ship, um, the Rebellion to the Resistance, it's organizations with essentially the same idea, but you can see that the, their ships have evolved. Um, so they're not stuck in the past the same way that, that the First Order is. And then the next thing I wanted to take a look at was, was uniforms. Um, the First Order's uniforms are, first of all, almost exactly the same as the Empire's uniforms. Um, everyone wears the exact same thing. So, you know, there's very little individuality. Again, it's this callback to the past. The Stormtroopers' uniforms, you can see one of them in the back. Uh, they have barely changed at all. Um, and, uh, Another thing you'll notice if you look, you can't see it as well here because there's only a few people in this picture. The people who staff Imperial ships and First Order ships are almost exclusively human. Um, they are very into human superiority. There is one very notable exception to this, but he has not showed up in live action yet. He's been in he has had books and he has had, um, he has showed up in some of the animated properties, but not in live action yet. Um, besides that, almost definitely all of the high ranking and most of the staff of the Imperial and First Order ships are human. Uh, so again, this is a callback to the past. There's plenty of other species. Uh, they like to conquer them instead of joining with them. Whereas if you look at the rebellion, they do have uniforms. Um, people kind of wear what they want anyway. If people are wearing the uniforms, they personalize them. Um, they have humans, they have droids, they have Wookiees. They have all kinds of species from all different planets um, that work together in the rebellion. So you can see that there's this very gothic, again, callback to the past in the first order, whereas the rebellion and the resistance have continued to evolve. And then I wanted to take a look at Ray specifically, because her aesthetics change as we move through her story. Um, she starts out, she's a junk trader. She's been abandoned on this planet. So she's just kind of dirty <laughs> through no fault of her own. Um, as we, this is episode seven, as we move to episode eight, you can see her clothes get darker um, because she is very tempted by this Gothic dark side. Uh, there's a chance she's gonna cross over. And then in episode nine, she's wearing white because she very definitively does not crossover, she makes the decision at the end of episode eight not to do that. So she moves very firmly out of the Gothic colors and into white. So 
now we're gonna do themes and I have more clips and stuff in this one. Um, so I picked this slide because it has a bunch of different themes in it. It has the color scheme, the black and red, it has the sharp edges and it has helmets, which as we all know is a big theme uh, <laughs> in Gothic literature. It also has, I mean, you essentially have the present praying, not exactly, but he has a shrine to the past. I mean, that's, you know, this is his grandfather. This is Kylo Ren, Ben Solo, um, who is Leia's son, essentially, you know, praying to his grandfather's helmet, Darth Vader's helmet, um, which is, we'll get into the Skywalker, the Skywalker generational curse in a little bit. Um, okay, so the first thing we have is this sort of evil uncle not genetically, technically, but, you know, roll with it here. Um, so we have this, this usurper who has, we don't know who he is. Um, you'll, you find out in episode nine, and I have opinions on that, but we won't go into that right now. Um, so this is, you know, Snoke and he has usurped this leadership role. He's, he's usurped the role of the emperor. His right to it is questionable. We don't know who he is. We don't know how he got this power. We don't really need to know at this point. Uh, we just need to know that he did it and he's there. And he is, he's old school. It's, a, it's an authoritarian type of power. He holds it with fear. Um, you know, he's a strong force user, which means that he can control people's minds and bodies from very far away. Um, he controls through threats. You know, we we see him in in episode eight dragging people's bodies across spaces and force choking people from a great distance away. Um, threats of what he will do to them, what he will do to their families, um, threats of him taking away the power that he's given them. Um, and he also gets control of people by promising, by promising them power. So one of the ways that he has gotten control of Ben Solo is to say, you know, your uncle, Luke Skywalker, tried to take this power away from you. Well, I've given it back. So now you're gonna serve me or I'll take it away from you again. And, you know, having had this power taken away from him when he was a child, Ben Solo Kylo Ren is very afraid of that, right? So this evil uncle is manipulative. He exploits weaknesses. He's a supreme gaslighter. Um, he isolates people, so he's taken, he's taken Kylo Ren away from his family. He said, you know, look what they did to you. Look what they could still do to you. Um, and uh, he uses these large spaces to intimidate and isolate and diminish people deliberately. So you know, it's the same thing again as he sets himself up in this leadership role and then uses a space like a great hall or a, a big mansion to make everyone else feel smaller. Um, and he's pretty terrifying. So then what we see is, you know, he has like this, this false prince that he sets up. Um, he picked an abused child, right, and gave him power over his abuser. So Armitage Hux, his father is an awful person who raised an awful person. But, um, and so a lot of this isn't in the movies, and I consume a lot of other Star Wars media, which is where you find a lot of this. Um, his father's an awful person that raised an awful person. He was a terrified and abused child who was given power by this, you know, false ruler. Um, and what that does is it creates 
you know, kind of a bootlicking zealot um, who is a zealot as long as it's convenient, um, but is also self-interested. He's going to protect himself and he's going to flip as soon as his as soon as his ass is in the fire. Um, so I have a clip for this one and leading up to this is the throne room fight, which I'll show you part of. But so what happens is Hux comes into the throne room after the fight and Ray and Kylo Ren have had this fight over um, Luke's lightsaber and it explodes. And it knocks them both out. Ray wakes up first and gets away. Kylo Ren is on the floor unconscious. And Hux is about to shoot him. And he wakes up. And this is what happens. And I just think this is this is a really good example of this sort of false, false zealot prince who is the false uncle's right hand as long as it's convenient for him. So he'll go with whoever Let's is holding this. the power. So then we have the Lost Prince. And a lot of people really hate Kylo Ren. I have a soft spot for him. And it's because of I don't like the way his story resolves but again that's a different conversation in the first two movies I have a soft spot for him because I think that he kind of I think episode eight he kind of clicked into this role for me because the second or third time I watched this I've seen this movie like 15 times but I had already started attending Sam's lectures like the third or fourth time I watched it. And I think I realized that this is where he fit into this whole thing. All right. So he is a rightful heir. His mother is a legit princess. So in another life, he would be ruling Alderaan. Um, but Alderaan is not there anymore. There's a lot of, so he is born into a lot of generational trauma. His mother lost her planet, lost her parents twice. So she lost her biological parents and she lost her adopted parents. She lost her planet and she's been fighting in a war since she was 15, essentially without stopping. She also lost her husband twice because they split up and he took off and then he died. So she's lost most of her friends. She's lost her brother. And at this point, she's lost her son. So he's had a lot of generational trauma, but he is technically a rightful heir. Except that there's all this generational trauma standing between him and having been that rightful heir. And now he's been gaslit by like, this horrible uncle. Um, so he knows this, but it's not going to happen. And that causes a lot of conflict, internal conflict. Um, and also, <laughs> his uncle kind of thought about killing him because he is so skilled and powerful so he his mother trusts her brother gives him to his to her brother his uncle who he trusts to raise him and train him in the force he's very powerful and he's touching the dark side but he's not there and his uncle's solution is to is to consider killing him instead of training him. So he's very skilled, but he doubts himself and he's conflicted because 
this other family member that he trusted was like, mm, maybe I should kill him instead of teaching him, right? So there's all this stuff between him and his, his rightful place, which should have been to be a very powerful Jedi. And there are other Jedi in history who have touched the dark side and used the dark side, but not been evil. Um, of course, he's tall, dark, and handsome. I don't know if anyone else has ever seen Adam Driver in anything else, but he's a giant. Um, <laughs> he's been trained. So all of these things that should have made him calm and confident and believe in himself have been flipped to make him doubt himself. So then this usurper comes in, makes him doubt himself even more, and then manipulates him. And manipulates his daddy issues because his dad took off, right? So then his uncle replaces his dad and his uncle proves not to be trustworthy either. He's trapped by this generational curse, which may be a self-fulfilling prophecy at this point. Um, have I mentioned the daddy issues? <laughs> he, because of all these ways he's been twisted up, he has been trained to be an incredibly toxic male who thinks that he needs to raise the heroine up when really he can't see that she's the one who could potentially save his ass if he let her. Um, you know, men can't live with them, probably shouldn't lightsaber them in the face. And he also has this really gothic, problematic relationship with helmets. Um, he wears the helmet, he smashes the helmet, he fixes the helmet, worships his dead grandfather's helmet. There's a whole helmet thing. Um, so then we have the heroine. And at one point he says to her, you have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. She has a whole false history implanted that she comes from nothing. Um, which is where, you know, the, the gothic heroine often, either she comes from nothing or she's led to believe for whatever reason she comes from nothing. In Ray's case, that ends up not being true. Although I wish they had left it that way because it's better than what they did. Um, you have a speculation about their relationship. Uh, <laughs> are they siblings? Maybe. Uh, that gets knocked down. Are they cousins? Is she Luke's secret daughter? Maybe that gets knocked down. Then people speculated that she was um, Obi-Wan Kenobi's daughter, granddaughter, granddaughter. Uh, and force lineage um, is a big deal in Star Wars. Like who people's master was is a big deal. Um, because being Obi-Wan's granddaughter would put her in the same force line as the Skywalkers. Um, none of that ends up being the case. She rejects safety and security for adventure. Um, she's given instruction by a strange hermit in the wilderness. <laughs> she has to fight for it. He doesn't want to give it to her, but eventually he does, um, because Luke is, has fled the scene and is living alone on this island. Um, she is far more than she knows or thought possible. Um, she chooses a cause and a found family over power. So she eventually finds out who she is and uh, decides she's not real happy about it and decides to be someone else. Um, she saves the day. Um, even though it's sometimes less than glorious and involves lifting rocks, which is a thing between her and Luke, a joke between her and Luke. Um, and she ultimately does save the hero, despite the fact that he can't see that that's something that she's supposed to do. Um, and even though he tries to kill her several times. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna talk about the Skywalker family's generational curse. Because, you know, we've talked a lot in a lot of different lectures about how 
a big theme in Gothic literature is the generational curse. So we're going to go all the way back to Anakin Skywalker's mother, Shmi Skywalker. Uh, we don't know where she came from exactly, but we do know she was a slave on Tatooine, um, which is like the ass end of the galaxy. It's a horrible desert planet. Nobody wants to be there. Um, we do know that Anakin was supposedly an immaculate conception, which is another reason not to watch the prequels because then you have to sit through all this horrible stuff that they decided to write into the prequels about how that happened. Um, we're not gonna talk about that. So she is a slave, she has a child. The child is raised as a slave until one day these Jedi, you know, happen up upon him. Um, so they take him. Shmi Skywalker is murdered in a massacre on Tatooine. Uh, so that's not great. <laughs> so next we have Anakin. Anakin, I, so <laughs> the reason I chose, chose an animated frame of Anakin is because I didn't really care about Anakin until I watched some of the animated properties and they had a really great voice actor and they did a lot more with his story. So I care about animated Anakin a lot more than I care about live action Anakin. Um, Anakin, you learn through more of the books and the animated properties. There's a lot more to Anakin's story than you see in the original three Star Wars movies. And what you see, and the prequels, and what you see is that the Jedi Council knew what was gonna happen. And they decided to test him to see if he could resist becoming evil. There was a prophecy that he was gonna become evil and they were like, mm, let's see what happens. Maybe he can resist it and become this great force user that he's supposed to be. And he didn't. And then they were like, oh no, now he's evil. Screw him. Um, <laughs> so really the Jedi Council could have stopped what happened to Anakin. They didn't. Um, and so he, I mean, people make their own choices. He chose to do what he did. He chose to sneak around and get married. Uh, he chose to have children. Um, he chose a lot of things. However, there are many places along the way where somebody could have intervened. Um, you know, his master, Obi-Wan, knew that he was secretly married and didn't do anything. Um, so, you know, in the end, through a combination of factors, of his own choices and choices other people made, Anakin lost the Jedi himself, his wife, his children, his best friend, and became Darth Vader. He also lost his Padawan. He did, so it's, it's interesting. I've, I wrote a paper on this that out of, I mentioned the line of force users, out of Anakin's line of force users, he was actually the only good teacher because when his Padawan said, I'm leaving the Jedi order, he said, okay. Um, he tried to leave, Anakin tried to leave the Jedi several times and they kept talking him back into staying, which is interesting because if they had let him leave, things would have ended very differently, but they didn't. So, so then we move on to Anakin's children, right? We have Luke who grew up on Tatooine, which is a horrible place, got, never could focus on where he was in a given moment 
you know, it's something Yoda says to him a lot. Like, your head is never where you are. It's always looking in the clouds. He, he, he did good. He saved a lot of people, but he left his training early because he was never looking at where he was. He was his own worst enemy. He wasn't ready to train other Jedi, but there was no one else. He betrayed his nephew instead of training him better. He thought maybe I should kill him. And yeah, he changed his mind, but it was too late at that point. Um, he gave up once. He tried once and then gave up and he ran away. He ran away from his sister. He ran away from his nephew. And he lived as a hermit on this island while everyone else he knew was dying, fighting this resurrected empire. He comes back at the end, but by then there's like a hundred people left. Then we have Leia. So what's interesting about their story as twins, so they're twins. Um, Yoda actually wanted to train Leia, not Luke. And that didn't happen. But Yoda thought Leia would be a better Jedi, which is probably true. <laughs> um, and at one point, Luke tried to train her. He wasn't good enough to train her because she was a better force user than he was. But Leia loses, like we already said, two sets of parents her planet, her husband twice, her son, her brother, and most of her friends. And she, you know, at this point in her 50s, 60s, has been fighting a war since she was 16 years old. Right, so then we have her son, who we've already talked about, right, who has no one and ends up in the thrall of this horrible person. So that's the Skywalker family curse. So then we also have, uh, we're gonna call them capable non-royals. So we have Poe Dameron, who is an excellent pilot, who is a decent tactical thinker when he, as Leia puts it, pulls his head out of his cockpit. Um, we also have, the reason Poe is such a great character. So one of the other non-Gothic but important themes in The Last Jedi is toxic masculinity. And the way that we watch it unfold is that Kylo Ren and Poe Dameron both have a chance to learn from women who are smarter than them. Okay, so Kylo Ren can learn from Rey and Poe can learn from Leia. Kylo Ren learns nothing. Poe listens to Leia and listens to Haldo and learns to be a capable leader. So one of his great capabilities is that he can learn. He learns how to listen and he learns when to pull back and he learns how to not be toxic. He learns that sometimes the women are smarter and that you should listen to them. <laughs> and he learns that sometimes you wait. You wait and you gather your people and it's not always about jumping in the next swing and blowing stuff up, although there are times to do that as well. Um, so that makes him an incredibly powerful character in this particular movie, especially when you compare him to Kylo Ren and to Hux and to the more gothic characters on the on the First Order side of it. Um, Rose is a fantastic mechanic, a really good negotiator, and she really holds the spirit of the resistance. Um, she will do anything to keep it alive which is really amazing. Um, and then Finn, 
throws off this programming. You know, this the new group of stormtroopers for the First Order is programmed from the time they're very young. And he throws off this programming and really becomes the hero, uh, which is very cool. And he sort of takes on <laughs> the head in the cockpit, Poe, um, old Poe style of doing things, but Rose knocks it out of him, which is great because he also learns to listen to other people. Um, so with all this past stuff, we get into um, this really interesting scenario of letting the past die, but also not. Like this whole idea of Kylo Ren saying, let the past die, but then he can't, which is what puts him back. He's so close to walking away from it, but then this happens set the whole throne room on fire, right? They're burning the past down. But then what happens? They fight over an old lightsaber. And then we get the scene with Hux, where he makes Hux call him by the same title that they called Snoke by. So he gets Hux. So in fact, he cannot kill the past. And he puts his helmet back together. So he gets stuck. Same loop. So another theme that I like from the Gothic stories that fits really well here um, is, the, is that the ghosts are often trying to tell people something um, and teach them a lesson. So this has a really good, um, The Last Jedi has a really good lesson from a ghost scene. And I also enjoy this because Yoda is being a total dick. Um, which is hilarious to me. Have books, someone pointed out, is interesting because this entire society is functionally illiterate because they have holograms for everything. Nobody has to read. <laughs> okay, so this is the last big one, and there's actually three clips for this one. So um, Sam has talked a lot about how many of the supernatural experiences in gothic literature is are ambiguous and i actually didn't even think about that in this movie until i watched it again the other day so this is this is three clips that line up in one to one experience and we can talk about it a little bit after So there's actually a clue before that, that he's not there, but I picked that scene because I think it's interesting. Usually they don't have force ghosts be able to touch things or people or carry things, but he's carrying something for Leia. He touches her. He does fight before this. He has a lightsaber that works, um, but there's a clue, and I miss it the first time, which is when they're fighting before this, he doesn't leave tracks in the salt on the planet. He's the only one who doesn't, who doesn't scrape the white salt away from the red, which is, it's really actually really beautiful. And then we have the helmets again. And the reason I brought them in again was I wanted to, it's a difference between the First Order Dark Side helmets, which cover your face and are black, in red um, and the the pilot's helmets for the resistance which leave your face open and again they're personalized um, kind of like fighter pilots do with their helmets they put different stuff on them um, but they're they're equally important to both sides but the way that they're made is different um, and that Kylo Ren he wears the helmet in the first one smashes it in the second one and then when he makes the decision to become supreme leader in the third one, he fixes it. That's it. That is what I have to say about that. <laughs>